Hi, I'm Andy, and in this video, we'll be exploring how to attack, detect, and defend against forced authentication. Most Windows domain systems use Kerberos to authenticate users to services, although its predecessor, NTLM, is still commonly left enabled for backwards compatibility. Let's start by taking a simplified look at the authentication flow for NTLM. First, the client initiates an authentication request. The server responds with a challenge containing a 16-byte random number. The client calculates the response based on the user's password, the username and domain name, and the various details of the challenge. The resulting response is sent back to the server, which verifies it against its own calculations of what the challenge response value should be, based on its knowledge of the user's password. If the two match, access is granted. The server has successfully authenticated the client. although. Note that at no point in this process did the client authenticate the server. So, an attacker who is able to trick a user into authenticating against a malicious server under their control is able to capture the challenge response and subsequently recover the plain text password with the help of a password cracker. But a user isn't likely to go away giving their username and password to a potentially malicious site, right? Well, okay, some might do, but for the purpose of this video, we'll assume at least a little bit of good user behavior. This is where forced authentication comes in. This technique involves taking advantage of genuine system features in order to force a user's device to attempt an authentication to a malicious server without the user even realizing it. There are several mechanisms which can lead to forced authentication, and we'll work through a few of the most common, starting off with a simple phishing link. This link is a Windows file sharing UNC path to a fictitious text file residing on a server under the control of an attacker. A user might think this is a bit fishy, but hey, it's a text file and that's not going to do any damage, right? One click and a little wait and an error. Note that this user was never asked to enter their credentials anywhere. Meanwhile, the attacker has been running a tool like Responder. Responder has a wide range of features to help lure victims, and we might explore some of those in a future video. But in this video, our attacker is just using it to capture the challenge responses directed towards it by the forced authentication method. Responder flags that it has captured a hash for the target user in its log file. Here's an example of using John the Ripper to crack the password. Password cracking is another topic I'll cover in more detail another time, but here, because a relatively weak password has been used, it takes just a few seconds to recover the plain text. The clicking on a link method is just one of several ways to trigger forced authentication. Another is through a malicious reference in a web page. For example, this page includes an image which is supposedly located on the attacker's machine. Note the use of the file colon slash slash protocol. This instructs the browser to treat this as a reference to a file via the local device's operating system rather than a web request. So, when the page is viewed, it again triggers a Windows file sharing connection and forced authentication. Other methods of forced authentication are possible by exploiting the way that Windows handles certain types of files. SCF files are Windows Explorer command files, and essentially allow for triggering of some very basic actions, such as minimizing all windows on the desktop. One of the parameters which can be set in the file is the icon which Explorer will display for it. And if you hadn't guessed by now, it's possible to set this to a UNC location under an attacker's control. The really sneaky thing about this attack is that there's no need to click on or run the file. Simply navigate into the same folder will cause Explorer to try to display its icon, forcing an authentication process. URL files are designed for internet shortcuts. These two can be abused in exactly the same way. You'll notice I've jumped onto a Windows 7 machine to illustrate these attack vectors, as Microsoft has since fixed its behavior in Windows 10. But I still wanted to include these here, given that, at the time of recording, Windows 7 still accounts for a big chunk of the workstation market share. And there's also still a lot of older server operating systems out there too, particularly in high value but hard to remediate areas such as industrial control systems. 
There's a few other variations on forced authentication, and new ones crop up from time to time. One notable recent example was in the Zoom video conferencing system, which saw explosive growth during the COVID-19 pandemic. Amongst the various security flaws uncovered in the software was one which automatically converted text which looked like a UNC path into a clickable link. And as with our first example, one click was all it took to unwittingly send credentials to an attacker. Monitoring traffic flows can provide some degree of detection. Throughout the course of the previous attack scenarios, I've had a Security Onion instance monitoring all the traffic across my lab network. The default Zeek NTLM dashboard that it provides lists out all the NTLM authentication attempts it has spotted amongst the network traffic, including sources and destinations. This destination panel is a key one. I know that the only server on my network is the one that is at 10.2.102.1. So it's immediately suspicious that NTLM authentications have been sent to the .169 address. We can filter out the genuine server to examine the suspicious events in more detail. Here we can see the IP address of this targeted workstation. And by expanding the details, we can also see the username of the targeted user. And then add that field to the tabular display so we can easily see the value for all other events. In addition to network monitoring, there are also options within the local security policy which activate auditing to record every time an NTLM authentication occurs, thus providing a more reliable detection control. As the name suggests, the Audit NTLM Authentication in this domain setting records all NTLM authentications within the realm of the local network whereas the outgoing NTLM traffic to remote servers setting relates to the more risky authentications to remote servers. This doesn't stop forced authentication from taking place, but at least results in event logs under Microsoft Windows NTLM Operational, where it's possible to identify the destinations where NTLM authentication challenge responses were sent to. The scope of attacks can be significantly reduced by some careful firewalling. It's a no-brainer to prevent incoming SMB traffic from the internet to an internal network, but it's just as important to block unnecessary outbound communications too. Blocking outbound SMB goes a long way to reducing the attack surface, as an attacker now needs a foothold on the internal side of the firewall to run their forced authentication harvester. A natural extension is then to introduce further segmentation within an internal network. As mentioned in previous videos, consider if there's really a need to permit workstation to workstation traffic between hosts, especially on Windows file sharing ports. Blocking such traffic makes an attacker's job even harder by limiting the list of devices which could harvest credentials to just servers, not workstations. However, note that Windows Explorer also has the added feature of attempting a connection using the WebDAV protocol if it's unable to reach a target server over the Windows file sharing protocol. We can simulate this by adding a firewall rule to block SMB traffic and then falling victim to a forced authentication again. It takes a little longer this time as Windows attempts the SMB connection first, fails, and then tries the WebDAV connection. WebDAB itself is an extension to the HTTP protocol. And sure enough, in the Windows event log, we can see that the target service is listed as HTTP. As WebDAV operates on port 80, or 443 if wrapped in TLS, it becomes more difficult to block without interfering with the user's genuine web traffic. In the previous section, we looked at the security policy options that enable these events to be logged. Some of these can also be used to block authentications. For example, outgoing NTLM traffic to remote servers can be set to deny remote authentications. And NTLM authentication in this domain can deny local authentications too. Blocking NTLM altogether is a good idea in modern environments where all systems support a more modern authentication method, but it could break some older apps. 
The policy configuration does allow an exceptions list to be defined, however, allowing for a default block behavior, even in environments where a handful of systems still require NTLM to be enabled. Finally, recall that this technique can only recover the NTLM hash of the victim user. In our example scenario, the plain text password could be quickly cracked because it was a relatively simple password. Adopting a stronger password policy involving a long random string makes cracking a lot harder, but is guaranteed to make users complain. Also, this doesn't make cracking impossible, just a lot more time consuming. An alternative is to adopt multi-factor authentication. This means that even if a password is compromised, it's of little use without the second factor. That about wraps up this video. If you found it useful, please do give it a like and consider subscribing if you want more of this sort of content. Drop a note in the comments if there's anything you think I've missed around attacking, detecting and defending against forced authentication, or if you have a good idea of what topic I should cover next. I'll see you next time.